let's see. Fifteen seconds. Okay, we're gonna go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, everybody. Um, you may... Notice that my webcam is now not working. <laughs> so this is me on a blank screen. Oh my god. Okay. What do you think, Steve? Shall we restart again or shall we just keep going? I'll leave it up to you. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, we'll, we'll just keep going with the live stream as usual. So everybody, um, everybody watching, we've been having unbelievable technical difficulties at the last minute starting this stream so um what we will be doing is we're just gonna go ahead and go through with the stream um even though my webcam is now not working and stuff but let me know if you can hear both me and steve um steve go ahead and say hello to everybody hello everybody okay uh All right, so I'm just going to wait and see if everybody in the chat says that they can hear us. And then we'll continue on with the stream as usual. <clears throat> okay, everybody says they can hear us, or at least one person said it, so... That's all that matters to me. Okay, folks, so this is a kind of different live stream than we're used to doing, um, but still ultimately the same. So basically, this is going to be about Queen Mary's technology, and in this episode, we're focusing on uh, the boilers. And so, yeah, that's what we'll be doing. Um, Steve, uh, oh wait, I should probably also formally introduce Steve. Steve is uh, my friend and colleague, um, I consider him a historian on the subject of Queen Mary, and especially because he's got lots of friends and, you know, all sorts of places that also lend their help and expertise whenever we do these streams as well. So say hello again to everybody, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hello again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was just so thrown off, like, from just the, the technical difficulties we had. So uh. where shall we start? Uh, well, um, first I'm going to say that even though I called this uh, Queen Mary Tech 101, I'm, I'm going to probably say that maybe this is more like remedial, <laughs> remedial boilers. Um, I'm wanting to try and keep this as plain, basic, layman a as possible. Um, I know that, uh, you know, it's easy to get carried away in the the technical uh, mumbo jumbo of of the ship, but I think that for the majority of everybody that's going to be watching, I think we should try and keep it. We'll try and keep it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. I agree. So we're going to be we're going to be covering her twenty seven boilers. She had twenty seven boilers on board, twenty four were of the Yarrow water tube type boilers, which were her main boilers for her steam turbines. And we're going to go into the, the basic system here in a minute. And she also had three what are known as scotch type or fire tube boilers. And those were for hotel services and to run the turbo generators in the forward turbo generator room. So I have pulled up here, folks, a little diagram, uh, just kind of color-coded to show you everything. So um, all these gray uh, squares here represent the Yarrow boilers, 
of which, as Steve said, there were 24. And then here's the three scotch boilers all the way at the front. Correct. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and play that, that video, the first one that I sent you. The um, pinwheel? Yes, the pinwheel. Okay. So here we see a little girl. She's blowing her breath into a pinwheel, and the pinwheel is spinning, and that is basically the entire basis of the propulsion system of the Queen Mary. The little girl's breath would be steam, and the pinwheel would be the hundreds and hundreds of finely placed uh, blades that are set in different uh, categories within the casing of each turbine. So instead of wind from the breath of the little girl, we're talking about high pressure, high temperature steam that passes through a set of windmills or uh, pinwheels. And that in turn turns a, a main gear, which turns a reduction gear, which, and there we go. There's the blades there on, on the, uh, the, the uh, low pressure there. Uh, that turns the propeller shafts, which turns the propellers. So that's that's the basic system of how the Queen Mary was able to move in the water. Uh, let me pull up my notes here really quick. So we're going to want to make sure that we, we understand that there were three necessities for producing that steam. And those three necessities are fresh water, which is not, you know, you have to basically store it um, unless you have high capacity means of converting seawater to to uh, to fresh water. And she did, she did have that, and we'll we'll talk about that briefly. So fresh water is one of the necessities. The other one is fuel oil, and the other one is air, uh, what we call forced draft, and we'll go into that that detail uh, as we progress here. Um, let's go ahead and pull up. Um, let's see here. Now, now, of course, all my notes are all jarbled. <laughs> it's just not a good day overall. Um, so let's go. Oh, oh, yeah. So let's go ahead and explain a little bit about the the actual system of steam. Um, obviously, the, the boilers are uh, producing the steam, and I'm pretty, pretty sure that everybody understands that we, we are burning fuel to heat the water to steam uh, to get the, uh, the pressure and the temperature needed for the turbines. And the Queen Mary had what was known as a closed feed system. Pull up that little weir ad uh, that shows the closed feed system. Uh, sure. or, um... uh, so many photos. No, let's feed water. Here we Look go. Look there. There it is. So uh, G and J Weir Limited is the uh, company that was commissioned to install the closed feed system for the Queen Mary in 1936 and uh, what a closed feed system is basically we're taking that water that's been been brought on board and we are going to uh, first treat it and then it will go into a system a, a closed loop where that water will never see the atmosphere again unless it has to go it'll go back in to, to get refiltered but it was basically you're going to heat the water you're going to you're going to boil it off to steam it's going to go through the turbines after it leaves the turbines it's going to be condensed cooled back to water and then fed back into the loop to be uh, reheated back to steam again so it never goes back into an open tank that would be exposed to the elements 
uh, you don't want to introduce other foreign material. You don't want to produce uh, or introduce gases into the in the line. You're wanting to keep it as clean as possible. This was also for efficiency. Uh, the uh, the efficiency of the whole, the whole closed feed system on the Queen Mary was 95 percent, uh, meaning that for every 100 gallons of water that was boiled up to steam. 95 gallons returned back to the boilers. So you only had a 5% loss. Uh, she carried she carried a total of 468 tons of fresh water. And they were stored in various areas uh, uh, in the wing tanks, which is right at the very bottom of the ship, uh, where the, the hull starts to curve upward towards each side on the port and starboard side. And they were also stored in the the double bottom tanks as well. Oh, let's see here. So we did have a five percent loss in the uh, system, and and that's you know due to the fact that you you have valves, you have stems that come off these valves, the packing in the valve. Uh, does you know give out over time? You'll have uh, you'll have a steam leak a little bit out of the out of a valve stem. Um, also, you have the uh, the steam whistles on the uh, forward and middle funnels that blows off into the atmosphere. So you, you you have a loss there that was already figured into the equation. So they they knew that they were going to be losing that five percent. And the Queen Mary was actually equipped with uh, with distillers in the forward engine room in 1936. And then during World War II, they actually increased her capacity to, to create fresh water by uh, installing evaporators in the aft engine room, which are still there today. They're in the uh, uh, they're in the forward port and starboard corners of the the engine room. Um, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to follow along on uh, we're going to first follow along with the uh, water. We're going to figure out how water is brought on board and where does it go from there. So let's see. I want you to bring up uh, the uh, deck plans to D-deck if you can. D-deck. Okay. Just a second. Now, for some reason, your screen on my screen is tiny and I can I can't see very good what you're showing, but it's good enough. It's part of the new settings. The the, the software made this the the screen for me even smaller, which makes it even smaller oh, for you. I don't damn like these that new settings. <laughs> I know. Uh, okay, so D deck you said right? Yeah. That's post war or pre war. <laughs> yeah, pre war. Yeah, pre war. Yeah. Okay. Um. hope this is the right one uh yes in fact scroll right there straight in where it says oil filling station port and starboard oh yes so the queen mary had four or i'm sorry the queen mary had six oil filling stations on d deck and we're looking at the forward port side oil filling station. This is where she would take on her her fuel oil. And this would also be where she would uh, be able to to uh, bring aboard fresh water as well. There were six stations total, three on each side. Uh, there was one right almost dead amidships, and then there's one near boiler room five. Let's see if he can... Here's another one. Yeah, correct. Oh, and... I think this this one also shows one of the oil filling stations. Somewhere. Oh, does it? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I found it the other day. I was I was I wasn't even planning on finding it, but then. Oh well, it's somewhere here. <clears throat> well, that's all right. We can we can. Yeah, we can go we'll on. Move on. <clears throat> Back to the so. 
uh, the Queen Mary would would take on water at both New York and Southampton. And when they designed the Queen Mary, they realized that uh, that Southampton water was extremely soft and New York water was extremely hard. So she basically she had two systems uh, for uh, uh, water conditioning where she could uh, bring the uh, solidity factors and and the uh, um, you know parts per million of, of material uh, calcium and all that kind of stuff that you could remove what was needed for either event either being extremely hard water or extremely soft water and but you know she and it would vary upon how much water she would need to take on board depending upon the voyage um, there were you know some cases where uh you know, as far as the steam was concerned, you wouldn't really lose very much, but you did have domestic water as well. So there was there was always a need to, to bring on fresh water at both sides of the Atlantic. Now, let's see here. I'm going to bring up my notes again. So uh, the, the term for water bringing brought into the ship from shoreside was considered raw water. And that was brought in through those filling stations. Uh, there was a uh, a series of uh, filters to remove like heavy foreign particles, but that was pumped into uh, into the raw feed water storage tanks, which were also in the uh, bottom of the double bottom uh, tanks. And from there, that water would be sent to the water softening plant, and that's where it would be conditioned uh, and ready to be uh, uh, used for firing in the boilers. And once it went through the softening plant, it would then go into different tanks that were known as the ready reserve feed tanks. And they were kind of also scattered about the ship. In fact, there were some um, uh, feed tanks that were even located on E-deck, uh, you wouldn't think that you would store water high up like that, but in this case, they they used it uh, mainly for gravity feed. So in case you had a, a situation where you didn't have a pump available, you could gravity feed water uh, to the boilers, probably particularly for the uh, uh, for the uh, the uh, hotel service boilers, and from from there, once the uh, the water was being demanded to, for, to enter the system, it would be sent to the engine rooms. You would think, well, you know, the water needs to go to the boilers. Why are you sending the water to the engine rooms? Well, because this is a, like I said, a closed feed system. And, uh, you know, water from the outside world is cold. And we do not want to introduce cold water uh, to the boilers, that would be that would be very bad. S so the water actually is sent to the uh, forward and aft engine rooms. The engine rooms had uh, what were known as hot well tanks, and these were preheated. They warmed the water up to a certain degree. Uh, these hot well tanks would also be where um, water was collected from the condensers. Water was collected from uh, various auxiliary machinery that ran on steam. Everything on the Queen Mary that ran on steam Oops. captured... Sorry. What was the matter? Oh. It, it was not on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, all, all the auxiliary steam-powered machinery on board would capture condensated water from uh, from the unit and pump it back into these hot well tanks. Uh, after going through a, 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 a uh, oil separation and filtration process as well. Um, from those tanks, it would then go into a cooler uh, to be uh, condensed back. If there was any kind of uh, still residual steam that was coming from, from the condenser, it would, it would cool it down so that it, you had pure water. There were air ejectors that would remove any gases that uh, that could not be uh, uh, brought back to liquid. 
Um, and then from there, it would go uh, into a low-pressure feed water heater. And that would raise the temperature of the water to 210 degrees. And, of course, as with everything with the Queen Mary, you didn't have one system. You didn't have two systems. You had three systems. So it went from the low-pressure feed water heater to an intermediate pressure, uh, intermediate pressure feed water heater. That raised it to 300 degrees. And then, and then it went to a high-pressure feed water heater. And there, that raised it all the way up to 370 degrees. Now, if you're probably wondering, 370 degrees is above boiling point we know that water boils at 212 degrees uh, this is a pressurized system so whenever you pressurize water you raise the boiling point so even though the water is now at 370 degrees it is still water it's just like like the cooling system and radiator on your automobile um you know, if you were to get a leak in your radiator or a leak in a, in a radiator hose, um, you'll get uh, steam coming out of it. Well, that's because you've now lowered the the boiling point temperature, and it's since the temperature of the liquid inside is ab is above boiling point to the atmosphere, um, you're going to gas it off, and that's going to you're you're going to have a a, uh, a fried engine uh, in short time if you continue to run your engine. So because it's pressurized, we have raised the temperature of the water to 370 degrees. And from there, it is then uh, sent through uh, uh, water feed or uh, duplex feed water filters. Um, go ahead and show that ad for the uh, feed water filter. Ah, so that big cylinder that's uh, to the far left there, you, you wouldn't believe this, but that's actually filled with coconut shell fiber. Oh. So this is the last step of any foreign material uh, being cleared out of the uh, out of the feed water system. And uh I should also point out that from this point, everything is duplicated. Everything that is on the port side of the ship is also duplicated on the starboard side of the ship. So we, we will actually have two feed water mains coming from the engine room now going aft to all of the boiler rooms. Um, I wonder if yeah. those are on here. Ah. Mm. No. Oh, By the way, I, I feed pump. I was gonna, I was gonna tell you that uh, I usually have two screens, so I can like have notes on one screen and and see everything. I, I'm down to one screen right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having to like minimize windows and then maximize windows. Let's see here. I don't see what. Let's see. Did you? Were you gonna show something? I I thought that I had on one of those those uh, plans you sent me. I thought there was a uh, image of the um, the pump, but it I think it was an oil pump instead. Uh, these uh, I was going to point out that this uh, these feed water filters are still in the aft engine room. Um, if you're on the uh, on the uh, maneuvering uh, valve platform. And you go off to the port side. There's a little walkway, a little catwalk that leads off and takes you to the door that leads into the exhibit hall, which would, would have originally let, led into the, the forward inch room. Um, that feed water uh, filter is actually right there near you as you make that turn to that door. Uh, I might have that on my video here. Wait, it's the next one. No. Oh, too far. Whoa, there it is. Well, there's the feed water tank. Yes. Uh, I don't see the... the yeah, I, don't, I think... 
it's over to the other side, if I remember correctly. Oh, no. I don't think I filmed that. Oh, no, I know where you're at. This is the door that leads down um, below the, the starting platform. Oh, yes, it is. Okay, so it was, yeah. it was further back? It's, it's, it's one, one level up, and Jeez. let's see here. No, yeah, you're far. you're going down you're going down the staircase down to the to the next uh I might have level. passed it here. So there's the control panel. Okay. Let's see if we Oh, I no, think that's no, it. Yeah. It, there it is. That's it. Yep. It's painted white, but it's the same it's the same doodad. It is the same doodad. Look at that. <laughs> That's so cool. I'm such a Well, nerd. that worked out pretty good. That did. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, so from that big, giant coconut shell fiber filter system, um, right next to that, uh, right next to that filter unit is actually uh, four turbo feed pumps. And that actually raises the pressure up to 425 psi oh gosh. pounds per square inch and that is what's going to send the the main feed water all the way back to the boilers all the way to the boilers all the way to the boilers wow. in fact the 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 feed the uh you have a main feed on either side like i said on the port and starboard side as they come into each boiler room there's there are branch mains that come off of the the main feed water line, and then from there um, they are controlled by what are known as robotic valves or, or nicknamed robo valves, and these uh, these valves were an automated system that determined uh, the necessity for water within the boilers. Um, obviously, if you're not having a great demand for steam you needed less water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were able to control the flow to the individual boilers um, as needed. Wow. And that was all based on, on pressure and temperature. Um, absolutely amazing, that, you know, from 1936 having that kind of technology, but, but they did. And so from there, they led into... Uh, to uh, each one of the boilers through the saturated steam drum, and we'll go into the uh, the details of the uh, boilers here in just a minute. Um, so that is the water, uh, the uh, the feed system of, of the water, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna cover how it works with steam here in in when we, we talk about the boilers, but I think we're going to, we're going to switch back to the fuel. Now we've got, we've got water. We need to burn the water. We need to heat the water to steam. So we're going to talk about the, the fuel system on board. So Queen Mary carried 8,630 tons of bunker sea fuel, which is a really heavy, it is the heaviest, most uh, viscous uh, of uh, fuel oils available. It's also the dirtiest of, of all the fuel oils. Um, it would also be known as, as number six uh, fuel oil. Uh, you know that you know diesel is number two. As the numbers go up, the um, the uh, con you know the consistency of it increases. It becomes heavier stickier the uh the number six and number five i believe they they both require to be preheated because otherwise they're not able to be pumped in in a cooled state they do have a, a really low boiling point uh temperature but they do have to be uh heated up to, yeah, to flow because at room temperature they're like molasses yeah exactly it is like molasses yeah it's it's pretty horrible um so let's uh let's see here 
and I oh and and another point thing to point out is is that uh, uh, while the fuel was kept in her fuel tanks, which she had forty seven fuel tanks on board, um, one uh, forty six plus she had an additional fuel tank for reserve fuel, mm-hmm. and all of these tanks were heated by steam loops. They had steam uh, lines that ran into the fuel tanks and were able to uh, uh, preheat the fuel. They kept it at about 110 degrees. It was able to, to be, to flow. Uh, it would work it, uh, work into what was known as a settling tank. And from there uh, uh, could be pumped out and go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, next stage. Yes, and the the tanks guys were located along the hull, along the whole length of the uh, boiler rooms and and engineering spaces of the ship, which is marked here in the dark gray. And then uh, you can see from this cutaway that when we zoom in, you can see that in some areas of the ship there was a good sixteen feet between the outer hull and the inner hull of the ship, so it would be a massive tanks, and they were all separated. Uh, how many did you say there were? 47? 46. For, well, 46. yeah, 47 total, yeah. Yeah, on the, yeah. So, yeah, that's like, what, 20, 23? 23 on either side. So, yeah, there was that was a lot of fuel. And, and remember that, and that's going about 30 feet tall. Yeah. From, you know, so about 30 feet by 16 feet, and each tank is probably about... Uh, Oh, uh, maybe about 12 feet long. Yeah, I'll show you guys a, a video of me walking through one of the boiler rooms. And it's really a cavernous space. I want you to see there's railing here. So a six foot tall person would, if standing on this platform, would probably come about to the tip of my mouse here. But you can imagine that standing against this wall that's 30 feet tall. Um, and it, it And correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but the curved lower portion of the wall that's the that's still water ballast tanks right and then above yeah, that's, that that's, is, that would be the wing tanks right, the right wing where tanks. you see that curve yeah mm-hmm. okay and then the straight part of the wall is the the oil tanks correct and that can and this area i think this is boiler room uh no two i think this is boiler yeah room. it looks like yeah yeah, yeah so i think room. here the the tanks are about uh, 12 to 16 feet uh, th- thick. So, yeah, pretty huge tanks. Yeah, right. At Boiler Room 2 is where the hull actually starts to come inward towards the bow. So as as the, the tanks are further forward positioned, they're actually becoming a little bit smaller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, right there, is actually uh, part of the bed of, of one of the boilers. And as they, re- not to get off track here, but as they removed these boilers during the 6871 conversion, um, they started off in boiler room five and worked their way forward. And when you look at some of the removals, like in boiler room five and then even in boiler room four, they were extremely clean like they they cut the the mounting uh, uh the mounts off the tank top flush with an acetylene torch mm-hmm. but as they got further forward they didn't quite go as clean as as they did and as you get further forward boiler room two um they actually really left part of the actual <laughs> boiler itself so when you're looking there that's that is the bottom frame of the boiler itself sitting there. Yeah. You can see still how bolted. The, the, yeah. the jagged edge that's still bolted to the flat uh, girder there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. I go back to my notes here. Uh, oh, pull up the picture of the oil firing unit. Okay, the oil firing unit. Uh, okay, I might need your help with this because I don't. There it is. That, oh, that's this it. Is it. 
Oh. <laughs> well, that was easy. Yeah, you got it on the first try. <laughs> so the the uh, I got the like back and forth from my notes here. Sorry about that. Um, so she had twelve of these uh, steam heated oil firing units, and basically they are superheating the the fuel. Um, in the tanks, they were kept approximately at about 110 degrees. But uh, in order for it to be super, super liquid, uh, available to be easily atomized, and we'll, we'll explain that in a minute, um, mm -hmm. it actually was raised to 180 degrees. And so these, uh, uh, these 12 units were Walson Howden, built by Walson Howden, and, but they were massive units. Um, they took up quite a bit of, of space in each of the boiler rooms. And uh, in 1957, when they uh, installed the uh, the Denny Brown stabilizers in boiler rooms three and four, it was decided to uh, uh, commission Thornycroft to come in and replace the uh, the fuel oil uh, firing units uh, to a much smaller uh, unit and that gave that gave the extra floor space needed uh, for uh, the installation of the uh, of the uh, stabilizers now there there were also two oh, electrically gosh. heated uh, oil firing units and these those were in the uh, in the uh, number one boiler room and that was so that uh, you could uh, you could start the uh, these units off electrically without having steam. You, if you get enough steam built up, you would then be able to uh, uh, bring on uh, more boilers as you, as you came along. You, you need to have more capacity for for heating the uh, fuel, but you were able to get this uh, these oil firing units up electrically. Um, it, as far as I know, I, I have, I would seriously doubt that the Queen Mary ever experienced a complete shutdown cold. Even when the Queen Mary was in, uh, in dry dock, it was standard to keep at least one of her Scotch boilers online. Uh, there is a possibility that they brought in shoreside steam uh, for some functions on the ship, but as far as I know, the only time that that she ever went completely cold was on December 11th, 1967, when when the boilers were shut down in Long Beach. <clears throat> it would be extremely difficult to to bring her from a dead cold, you know, cold fuel tanks, cold boilers, um, it would be extremely difficult to do. Yeah, because to, to recap for everybody, I mean, you have the fact that you need to heat up the oil, which needs to be extremely liquefied. It, again, at room temperature, it's molasses. So you gotta heat it up hot enough that it is extremely liquefied so you can atomize it. And we'll talk about that later. And then, right. um, and then the fact that you, need all these appliances that run on steam power to even <laughs> to even like atomize it and get everything going like it's it's a lot more tedious i think than even running a steam locomotive oh yeah absolutely yeah um now luckily the scotch boilers did not have as great of a demand they uh only kept the fuel uh, the the uh, oil firing units in the number one boiler room only heated up to 122 degrees instead of 180. And uh, adjacent to these oil firing units were the fuel oil pressure pumps. And I think there's a picture of a, a fuel oil pressure pump. Uh, let's see. Oh, yep. Here we go. Fuel oil pressure pump. Yeah, bingo. Yeah. So these units here... Uh, now I got to go back to my notes. <laughs> <laughs> These units here um, actually raised the the fuel line pressure to 300 psi, 
in the in the number one boiler room they were only needed to go it was only needed to go to 150 psi but for the main boilers uh in the uh number two to number five boiler rooms they brought it up to 300 psi and from those oil uh pressure pumps uh that fuel was then sent through a uh a fuel oil delivery line that that now went uh went to each of the boiler rooms and uh you had a you had a line that came out that fed each row of boilers there was what was known as a fuel header that ran across these rows of boilers um and then from those headers you had individual lines that came down and went to each individual burner on on a boiler and the yarrow boilers had seven burners the scotch boilers had eight burners total they were double-ended so you had four on one end and then you had four on the other shall i show a picture example of a uh, double-ended scotch boiler yeah uh. so this one isn't exactly queen mary's it's quite similar except it has only three furnaces whereas queen queen mary's had four um but uh, this is a double-ended scotch boiler and you might recognize these more because if especially if you're a titanic fan that's the kind of boilers that titanic had except hers were coal fired and this is an oil fired one like the queen mary exactly so oh. should we um what do we uh uh so we're gonna go ahead and uh uh, well, I was going to explain it. Well, we were we were following along the fuel line going to the burners. Okay. And uh, and you're probably wondering then, well, how does how how does the fuel get in to get burned? So uh, at each burner of of each boiler, you had a uh, you had a line that came into a uh, Oh, good grief. My notes just went crazy here. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were fed into a... You had a, a controlling valve so you could shut off the, the individual burner and then went into a nozzle that would fit into the burner face. And at the end of that nozzle, uh, you had what was uh, a burner tip. And just picture the burner tip to be like the head of a sprinkler on your lawn. Um, in this case, it was multiple holes in a, uh, they were they were small holes that were drilled at an angle and they worked around in a circular fan motion. So as fuel was pushed through those holes, it would actually fan out in a kind of a, a cone shape out from that, uh, from the end of that tip and those tips could be interchanged they uh they had a numbering system uh that would vary you know in, in size of the of the holes so as if you were needing more more fuel more steam um you know more capacity out of the boiler you would increase those uh the, the size of the hole where if you uh weren't having that much of a demand for for fuel you would change the tips down to a smaller, smaller uh, tip hole size. But from there, the fuel actually then hit a, a, a mounted plate called a sprayer plate. And from there, that it was basically like a round disc. And it had swirling grooves that were made into this disc. And the fuel would hit that disc and then, and then create like a tornadic action so uh so you had and we'll go into the, the air in a minute but you do have air that's coming into these uh, furnaces and you combine the air uh right at that point of that that uh sprayer plate with the fuel it would create a tornadic action in the furnace and and, and be ignited from from the existing uh fire that you have in there but it, it, it you got the most amount of efficiency 
uh, for that action. That's the reason why they had that there in the first place. And that whole action uh, is, is atomizing the fuel. You're basically taking, you know, the droplets of fuel oil and you are breaking them down into very, very, very small particles. And, and that's what they call dynamic pulverization of the fuel. But a quick, uh, a, a quick uh, little bit of uh, numbers to throw at you. Uh, the Queen Mary uh, I t- said uh, she carried 8,630 tons. Uh, she would approximately need to refuel uh, on either side of the Atlantic. It, it would vary, but roughly about 6,000 tons. Uh, she was considered dead empty at 150 tons. They, they have 150 tons of fuel would always remain in the tanks simply because they don't suck the fuel from the bottom of the tanks. Um, so even with 150 tons of fuel, she was they, they would consider that empty. Um, uh, she uh, would travel on average 28 and a half knots. While she was traveling 28 and a half knots, she would burn one barrel, approximately 42 gallons, every 12 seconds. She would burn she would burn 406 gallons every nautical mile. That's about 13 feet to every gallon. It took 78 gallons to travel her own length. Jeez. 78 Not- gallons of fuel just to travel her own length. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, um, let's see. I want to make sure I didn't lose my point here. Um, oh, yeah. All right. So, all right, yeah. So let we, we break down into the actual boilers themselves. So now we know how we know how the water system works. We know how the the, the uh, steam loop works. We know how uh, the fuel was heated, and pressurized, brought into the the furnaces to be ignited to create the steam. Let, let's talk a little bit about the boilers themselves. Okay. Uh, go ahead and pull up that the the ad picture of the uh, of the arrow boilers. Okay. So the uh, twenty four main boilers on board were were built by uh, Yarrow and Company in in Glasgow. Um, they were actually constructed at at John Brown, tested at John Brown. Uh, they were hydrostatically tested before they were brought on board. And then, uh, believe it or not, the Queen Mary was launched uh, on September 26, 1934. The first boiler was installed on September 28, 1934. Here's a picture of the very first boiler being installed on the Queen Mary. <clears throat> And this is this is boiler, this is boiler uh, A two, and uh, go ahead and pull up the uh, the deck plan uh, of uh, the boiler rooms. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So each boiler is given a letter designation. Uh, if we start off with boiler room one, she had three boilers the three of the scotch type boilers and they were known as a one on the port side b1 in the middle and c1 on the starboard side and it was always easy to remember that uh any boiler with the designation of b or the designation of e would be the middle boiler so in boiler room two we have a1 at the forward port side a2 in the middle and A3 on the starboard. And you know what? I said it was boiler A2. It's boiler A3 that was brought in first. Oh, okay. uh, they, they, they installed the wing, the wing boilers first and then installed. 
and and believe it or not, they they were actually brought in through the forward engine room hatch, and then uh, they had a a uh, a like a track system and a steam uh, winch at the forward end of the hull, and and brought them in on a track, and then put them into place in each of the boiler rooms. They didn't bring them down through the the uh, the funnel uptakes because the crane was in a position where it, it couldn't be moved. So they, but it was in position for the the forward engine room hatch, and so they they brought them down that way. Oh wow! Yeah, they um yeah. so so uh, let me make sure I heard that right. So they would bring it down uh, through the hatch, and then they would slide it through the boiler rooms to its destination. Right. Yeah. The um the uh the bulkheads in between the boiler rooms uh were temporarily put into place they were bolted into place um at the time of launching and then once she was you know floated out and brought into the fitting out basin they removed those bulkheads the center portions of the bulkheads and then and then built that track system in and with the with the steam winch you know winch them through on that track and into place into each boiler room. Wow. It's amazing. Cause these things are huge. You guys, I don't know if you realize, but like if a person were standing next to this, uh, because this is also was a false floor that was at this level. But if you were standing right next to this right here, your head would probably meet the top of this thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. So they're, they're basically, uh, 24, 24 feet long. They're 27 feet wide at the top, uh, from, from side to side. They're, uh, 30 feet. Let's see, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm going by my memory and not by my notes. Um, <laughs> uh, they are 30 feet tall uh, to the tallest point of the boiler. So they are roughly, each the size of a two-story house i mean i'm sorry a three-story house oh my gosh not a very big floor plan but but yeah they, they are they are three stories tall they actually went up to 49 feet uh, once you had the the uptake plenum uh, attached to them massive just absolutely massive and of course my notes just went haywire and i'm completely lost my place again oh boy what a day what a day oh oh yeah okay so uh so there were 24 of these boilers and are you can you go back to the uh, deck plan absolutely okay <laughs> so there were actually two sizes of these main boilers um boiler rooms four and boiler rooms five uh, scroll over to the left there a little bit. So there's four and five. Four on the right, five on the left. Those were the larger of the uh, of the two types of boilers. Um, they uh, uh, I just lost my place again. Uh, the the other two the other two boiler rooms, boiler rooms three and boiler rooms two, have a slightly smaller. Uh, footprint of a boiler. They were slightly less in their, you know, their uh, capacity for for steam. Um, but they, what they did was they divided them up so that boiler room two and boiler room four, which you had one of the smaller type, one of the larger type, was the main source of steam for the forward engine room. Boiler rooms three and boiler rooms five were the main source of steam for the aft engine room. Oh, I see. Okay. I had totally miscalculated that. <laughs> it's easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really hate this having to go back and forth. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll give you a few other little uh, notes of uh, figures. Um, Uh, inside these boilers, oh, pull up the um, the uh, side profile drawings of, of a Yarrow boiler. That's what we need. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
like this one? Correct. Okay. Can you zoom into the bottom? Oh, like uh Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, either side, that's fine. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. I'll no, it doesn't matter. Side. So you can see that little the little checkered design in there and what you're what you're seeing there, it, that is the firebox, which is number 6 in this uh in this configuration here. And that that checker uh hash uh design that's in there, that's what's representing the fire brick. Um Oh, the fire the uh, the fire boxes were completely lined in very very thick fire brick. Uh, in fact, out of the twenty four boilers, uh, she had five hundred and twenty one tons of fire brick in those in those boilers. What and do the fire bricks do? They insulated the the fire box. They retained heat. Um, so that, uh, in fact, they retained so much heat that when the Queen Mary would come, oh, maybe about 50 miles from her destination, you know, either New York or, or Southampton, um, they would actually like shut the burners down or begin to start shutting them down. But there was enough residual heat from the fire brick to continue to produce steam enough steam to bring her the rest of the way into Southampton or into New York. And, and so it was, you know, it would cut on, on, on fuel consumption because you're, you're, you're you know, she's, she's reducing speed. Um, she's only going to need it to, you know, maneuver up the channel uh, and, and, and uh, maneuver herself, you know, or aid herself into, into her dock. Um, but once, you know, once she's there, they would actually shut down, completely shut down all of the boilers except for like one or two of the of the Scotch boilers. And they would remain that way until uh, just before uh, sailing time. Uh, let's see, I wanted to continue on. Uh... Oh, and, and there were 381 different patterns of cut fire brick so that they would all line you know perfectly in place you know along the different along the, the four sides of the walls of the of the firebox 381 different patterns jeez uh let's see some other numbers here to throw at you um the yarrow boilers produced 80,000 pounds of steam per hour uh collectively all 24 of them Produced one million nine hundred and twenty thousand pounds of steam per hour, uh, or sixteen tons of air. Or, I'm sorry, sixteen tons of steam per minute. Uh, collectively, all twenty-four of them would evaporate two hundred and thirty-nine thousand six hundred gallons of water per hour. Oh my gosh. Yeah, num numbers numbers are always pretty impressive when it comes to the Queen Mary. Um, let's see. So we've covered the, uh, the the Yarrow boilers. Now, although I these were used primarily for s supplying steam for the turbines, Boiler Room Five supplied steam to the aft turbo generator room, uh, which supplied uh, a lot of the electricity for the electric auxiliary machinery on board. Um, the forward turbo generator room was supplied by steam from the Scotch boilers, and those operated some of the smaller, um, not necessarily you know primary auxiliaries uh, needed uh, electrically, but but ran some of the smaller systems, and then all of course all of the hotel services. Uh, on board um, but as with as to be expected everything was cross connected I mean if, if it was a necessity to run something not necessarily you know standard procedure you could always get steam from other sources the turbo generators in the aft turbo generator room were designed to actually run on on a higher pressure the the ones in the forward turbo generator room ran at, at a lower pressure uh, than say the main boilers. 
So if there was a need to to run the the forward turbo generators, they would have to reduce you know reduce the pressure of steam uh, before they could they could use that. But it was possible. It was I don't know if it was necessarily done all that often, but it was possible to do. And they would also uh, rotate usage of, of boilers. They had you had three of the Scotch boilers in boiler room one, and it was typical to only keep two of the three fired. And and say on one voyage they would keep boilers A one and C one fired and keep B one cold. On on her next uh, you know opposite direction crossing you know they may change and go to uh, to B one and C one, and then on the next crossing they would do B one and A one. So they would rotate them around. So they all got the same amount of of usage. Um, so you didn't have one sitting uh, idle, which can often cause you know you get corrosion issues and uh, you know um, seals fail, such fail, and you get pitting in the tubes. And so there was a there was a, a method for that. But they did that with everything on board. Um, any kind of pumps, um, you know, there were, you know, always, you know, at least three or four or five pumps for, for one particular system. They'd only run two or three of them. And then they would rotate them, uh, depending upon uh, what was decided for each for each crossing. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think we've covered the Yarrow. So we'll, we'll cover the, I'll just cover the Scotch boilers really quick. They're, they're pretty... Oh. Pretty I easy. Wanted to show people this picture real quick oh, because yeah. I know I realized I forgot to show it, but yeah, this ahead. this is um now correct me if I'm ah. wrong, Steve. I'm gonna try to explain it as fast as I can. But yes. this pipe that goes across the face of the um of the boy of the the Yarrow boiler is the oil feed pipe. Is that right? Well that would be the header pipe. The header pipe, so it yeah. but it, it feeds oil, right? Yes. And then Yes, and okay. Yeah, and you're looking at the you're looking at the individual burners, and just to point out that this is the this is a post fifty seven shot. So these are the Thornycroft um, modified uh, burners instead of the original uh, uh, um, I always forget the name uh, 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 Walson Howden uh, boiler uh, burners. Um, and when they changed to the Thornycroft system, uh, it was originally a a rigid pipe set up to each burner, to each to each nozzle on each burner, and uh, the Thornycroft setup gave them a, a flexible braided hose to each burner, so it was a lot easier. So you you would actually be able to take that whole unit out from the burner face, take it out, and it oh, oh yeah, can you show up? Uh, show uh one of the pictures of like boiler room four boiler room five with the like the workbench on it yeah uh let me just get that there we go so right there you can see there's a workbench in between the uh, uh the uh fire boxes here in the in this firing uh aisle way and down at the bottom you can actually see there are there are nozzles uh, it looks like it might be nozzle. It might be nozzle. They might be. Yeah, I think those are nozzles. I think. Um, yeah. But you, they, they could change those out. They would use that workbench to to change out the uh, the burner tips. Um, also, they had kerosene uh, torches. Uh, those actually might be kerosene torches um, for initially fire uh, igniting fires in the um, in the. Uh, Fireboxes when they were starting up the boilers. That and might be I what they are. Here too, ash pans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that's that's going to get a little bit out of my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's not get into that then. Yeah, I'm. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'll, I'll. I'll let everybody know. I am. Uh. I would say maybe I'm I'm like instead of class 101 for for boiler technology I'm probably at like 201, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've been working with uh, a guy named Robin Jacobs for almost yeah almost 26 years now, and and he is the the ultimate guru of 
of uh, boiler and uh, steam technology for the Queen Mary. And uh, I usually get all of my knowledge in this field from him. And uh, of course, I, you know, I, I've tapped his brain numerous times. So that's something I'm going to have to tap it, tap his brain on again. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, that you know, the workbenches there were, were specifically so that you could bring out the, bring out the burner nozzles, um, change the tips out, put them back in. Um, and I, and I think those are, I think those are the kerosene torches that they use to, to, to light the, the, uh, furnaces up. Oh, okay. And then this is, this is the, yeah. the nozzle that Steve was talking about. It's right there yeah. in the little hatches and that sprays the 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 fuel into the firebox. So, you know what? Actually, it's the best thing to just leave that image right there. Oh, okay. So, I, I just want to touch base really quick on on what a water tube boiler is mm -hmm. and uh what you're you're seeing a cutaway side profile of one of the uh the Yarrow water tube boilers. And basically what you are doing is you are heating you're igniting the fuel into the firebox and you're creating superheated gases that will want to basically find their way out and they're going to go up. And as those gases come up, they are going to run across a huge maze of tubes. And the, and these tubes are uh, what the, um, uh, uh, what carry the water that will from the heat of the gases turn to steam and they go through a different series of of loops and drums and we start off first with the very large top drum which is what's called the, the saturated steam drum and basically it's it's uh it's kind of filled a little bit halfway with the uh, water and about halfway with like residual steam. Uh, the water, you see that all the tubes lead into the bottom half of the, of that uh, drum. So you're feeding water down into those tubes. And, and as it comes into contact with the, with these gases in the inside the firebox, um, it's now turning it to a gas. But the idea is to try and get it, heated up uh what we call superheated uh you have water that's boiling at 212 degrees in, in normal atmospheric conditions at sea level uh but if you uh, when you boil water when you have it you know like a, a, a kettle on on the stove um you see the you know the wisps of white steam coming off of the off of the uh, kettle, and that's what's known as saturated steam. It's basically right right at that temperature of 212 degrees. But if you heat that further, if you go beyond 212 degrees, if you go to say 300 degrees or 400 degrees, um, that's now what they call superheated steam, and uh, it's invisible. It's not, you don't, the only time that you see that white is because there's actually like water. Um, you have the water vapor that's, that's uh, being seen, you know, by the naked eye. So these boilers actually raise the steam temperature to 400, 400 PSI, 700 degrees. And uh, with that type of temperature and pressure of superheated steam, it was extremely dangerous because if you had a leak somewhere, you would definitely hear the leak, but you would not see the leak. Uh, it, was a, it was a common practice to have basically like broomsticks, small pieces of wood um, around uh, so that you could grab to go look for a steam leak because uh at that pressure and at that temperature it would be like a hot knife through butter if you happen to walk through it so it, it could sever an arm it could sever you 
in half if if uh if it was at the right location uh and you didn't know it was there mm-hmm. so they would w- want wave those broomsticks around to to look for uh a, a leak if they knew that there was a leak somewhere and uh and it would you know more than likely sever the the uh the piece of wood better to sever the wood than than part of your body steve uh could you confirm that number four here uh on the side of the boiler is the superheater that is the superheater tube right and the i think app- what makes it so recognizable is the tubes that lead back into it so it's right the, the steam rising up into the uh heated ex- exhaust chamber and then heating right. the steam up again <laughs> yeah and, and, it, and it goes back several times back and forth through those loops and it's just to get that extra little that extra little boost of temperature and pressure. And, and what you have to re- remember is that whenever you're increasing temperature, you're increasing pressure. So as the temperature gets higher, um, the pressure also gets higher. So like I said, 700 degrees, 400 PSI. Um, now the water that's uh, being fed from the, wa- the main water feed that's coming that we were talking about earlier it actually had to get pressurized to 425 psi. It always had to be a little bit higher than what the steam pressure was for the output of the boilers, so that you could you could force it into the system. If it was the same pressure or lower pressure, you'd never be able to get more feed water into the boilers. So it was always at a slightly higher pressure than than the operating uh, output of the uh, of the boilers themselves. Incredible. And the the Scotch boilers um, were a little bit different. Um, let's go ahead and play that little video really quick. Sure. Uh, let me just sync this thing. So I can't play the sound because I, I would get copyrighted. Not. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But we can kind of. I'll slow yeah. this down actually. Oh yeah, that'd be good. So what we're we're looking at here is the construction of of a Scotch boiler. Now in this case, this is a two burner uh, Scotch boiler, and I believe it's it is going to be a double ended boiler. So you can see the two the, the uh, burner ends here on this side, and uh, well, I mean maybe we might be going well, a little is, bit slow. <laughs> it might be going a bit slow, uh, but basically, here's one end where the burners are the other end right. where the other burners are and then what we were right. watching get constructed was kind of the exhaust chamber yeah, between the two right exactly so um so we we were talking about the yarrow boilers being a water tube boiler which is basically a big fire pit with the with tubes of water running overhead that would uh get the heat from the firebox and turn to steam so in this case, uh, this is a fire tube boiler, and so we've we've got the fire boxes down below, and they're not they don't have fire brick. They're actually in a like a corrugated um, chamber, and that was to help um, like with the heat flow and everything. Yeah, there's the corrugation. Um, it helps with like bringing the flow of heat in from the fire and then up into uh, the um um oh i forget the name of that there's a, there's a name for that there is i don't remember <laughs> yeah, what it is. i can't remember what it is um but the reason why it's called fire tubes is because we're, we're now changing the whole aspect um we now have a basically a, like a cistern uh sitting at the top of the boiler and the the gases from the firebox are led into a series of pipes, and and those pipes run through the cistern, which is heating the the water inside. And at the top of the cistern would be a steam dome, which was where that steam is now being collected. And right there, as they're showing, there's the valve at the very very top, and and you've got. Uh, the steam is uh, let out through that main valve there. 
And the only difference between this and ones on the Queen Mary is that uh, there were four boiler, four burners on each side instead of two. Um, they were, I do not remember what the name, what the manufacturer of the boilers were on Titanic, but um, uh, these were uh, uh, Rankin and Blackmore boilers. And Harlan and Wolf, who built Titanic, uh, designed the um, the furnaces for the boilers, and and then um, uh, Walson and Howden, uh, who did the same uh, oil oil firing units and the burners for the Yarrow boilers, did the uh, the burning burning units and the oil firing units for the Scotch boilers, and these operated at much lower pressures than what the uh, the Yarrow Scott, uh, uh, water tube boilers operated at. These only operated uh, at um, uh, oh, of course, my notes just went away again. Weren't they 350 pounds? Uh, 270. Oh. Let's see here. Uh, I'm sorry, 250 uh, PSI uh steam was 220 degrees so it was slightly superheated but 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 only slightly um they each boiler carried 63 tons of water um in these in those cisterns um they were tested to operate at 425 psi they could squeeze more out of them if if necessary but it wasn't necessary um and there was something else about the uh the Scotch boilers I was going to go into, but I can't remember now what that was. I'll show everybody a, a picture of one of the Queen Mary's double-ended Scotch boilers being installed. Yes. So Now, they would have been installed first. So when, when we showed the picture of that first boiler, I, I should have stated that that was one of the first of the main boilers to be installed. And this would be boiler A. This would be boiler A1. Yeah. Now, for those of you who own the book Queen Mary, Queen of Queens, uh, the author does mention in that book, though I have not been able to confirm it outside, but uh, that Queen Mary was originally designed to have entirely all double-ended Scotch boilers for both propulsion and for um, running appliances and things around the ship. Uh, but then during construction, uh, Cunard White Starline had decided to go with Yarrow boilers for the propulsion system. And so that had a contribution to uh, the fact that the Yarrow boilers, while they were slightly larger, weighed less. And that had some kind of contribution to Queen Mary's rolling. But that is from that particular book. I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere else. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So, so in, in the beginning, I had made the comment that uh, we had three basic necessities. We, we needed fresh water, we needed fuel oil, and we needed air. Mm -hmm. And we've covered the, we've covered the fresh water, we've covered the fuel oil. So now we're going to cover air. Um, so the Queen Mary had a forced draft uh, system. Um, can you pull up a picture of, like, it can be a modern day picture of her upper decks? I was actually just looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're going to need a picture of the upper decks, aren't we? Okay, hold on. Uh... Oh, I know where to go. I know. we go yes that'll work um let's see here uh can you zoom in just a little bit more i'm trying to see here um you're gonna talk about the large cow vents yeah um yes 
now the now the large Calvins, you, you can see that there are four on each side, and they are supplying uh, the uh, force draft for the four main boiler boiler rooms, boiler rooms two through five. Um, but if I remember correctly, I believe that the smaller ones that were used for boiler room one, um, no, not that one. Yeah. But there was one that was about that size, a little smaller, but but right there just uh it, it was somewhere here. Yes, and they and they were removed, I mm -hmm. believe, during the conversion. Um but all I should I just wanted to point out that all oh. yep, yeah, 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 there it is right there. You can see it. Yeah. So that would be the uh the air intake for the number one boiler room. But all five boiler rooms had a forced dr draft system. The the Scotch boilers had what's known as a um, a closed ash pit for draft for forced draft, which basically um, you are you are bringing in fresh oxygenated air from the outside um, that's uh, that's being uh, drawn in by uh, by fans huge fans. Um, let's see if I've got the figures for those here really quick. Uh, let's see here. Boiler room one had 60 inch fans. Boiler rooms two and three had 63 inch fans. Boiler rooms four and five had 66 inch fans. Um, in boiler room one, they were drawn in through, uh, uh, brought into the um, into the ash pit of the uh, of the boiler. So w bring up that uh, picture of that boiler sitting outside. Uh, okay, that's a perfect perfect example. Uh, here we go. So so the closed ash pit. Uh, force draft is actually the that those big trunks that you see, you know, leading out from the face of the boilers on either side on either end there. That's the force draft uh, closed dash pit system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see here. Uh, and of course, I just lost my notes again. I really hate having a single screen. Every time I click, I click on a window, and the window is not the right window, and it, and it goes it goes away. Uh, folks that are watching, I know some of you are interested in some of the photos. Um, if you have a photo that you really want me to send you, take a screenshot of it, and then email me and say, "Hey, I want this photo," and I'll send it to you. Ah, yes. Um, uh, so the, when we when we look at that picture of that of that boiler, the force draft uh, setup for the Queen Mary's boilers would have been pretty much about the same way, uh, and you would had would have had these units coming down into into the face of each boiler on each side since they were double ended. And uh, let's see, do I have the capacity for this boiler room one? I don't uh, think so. to Ethan Boy. Ethan Boy says fans were not used for draft for scotch boilers yes but in this case they were you see the fans were not located on the boiler itself the fans were located up in the um somewhere on in the, the upper deck. decks of the ship as it was being drawn from the the uh right. the sports deck essentially yeah. so that's the, why we showed uh, a picture of... what the difference what the difference would be is that uh boiler room one the boilers are are forced draft but they are being they are forced draft through the actual boiler itself and not into the boiler room mm -hmm. the and and what the what i was going to get to is in the in boiler rooms two through five for the yarrow boilers they had what was known as a closed stokehold for forced draft setup and in that case you had those larger cal vents that led you know fresh air down 
fed through fans, large capacity fans, and pressurized the actual entire compartment uh, that held the boilers. Mm -hmm. And they would raise it to about four to five uh, pounds above atmosphere. So about four to five PSI G. And it would be, and that was the reason why they had uh, airlocks going in between each boiler room because as as the uh, you had different demands for different pressures going from one boiler room to the next. And then, of course, if you were outside of the boiler rooms coming in, you would also need to go through an airlock and it would it would it would pop your pop your ears. It'd be like, you know, a sudden rapid uh, ascent, you know, on an airplane. Uh, you, know, you, you would feel it in your ears. Um, but that is the difference is that the they were pressurized, whereas Boiler Room 1 was not pressurized. If you could explain in a really simplified way how this right. double-ended scotch boiler was force-fed air, like a really simplified way, how would you put it? Well, it's fed directly into, into the firebox. Um, and, and just like... Uh, uh, remember, I was talking about like creating that tornadic action. That those are leading down into that corrugated um, uh, tube, you know, the the the, fi the fireboxes themselves, and then uh, drawn in, uh, creating that that tornadic action. Uh, now this is being fed like directly through the front, but oh, and and the reason why it's also coming through the front is you're also preheating that air. So the heat from the casing of the boiler is heating is preheating the air prior to it entering the uh, the fireboxes, and it was done the same way in the uh, other boiler rooms for the Yarrow boilers. But instead of it being fed uh, through the um, uh, through the outside of the of the boiler casing like you see here, it was actually drawn up. Uh, at the upper level of the boiler itself and brought in through uh, it's a like a separate casing like you had you had an inner casing for the actual boiler and then like an like a like a jacket for an outer casing and that that uh forced draft is fed down into that that space where it would be preheated from the the heat of the boiler casing itself and then fed right to the point of where you have the burners and and the air was fed out and mixed with the with the fuel it went to that uh the spray plate and and did that swirling tornadic action and uh you know created the the uh efficiency of burning fuel and 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 the increasing of the temperature of the fuel of the of the fire And then someone asked about the exhaust. This is part of the exhaust. So the fire would shoot in this way, come through the center of the boiler, go up, go through the fire tubes, and then come out up through here and get shot up through the funnel. Yeah, I think actually, I think you've got. Um, I think it's it's a combination of both. I believe that uh, that you've got uh, exhaust and and the air intake uh, combined in this in this area. I I may not be exactly one hundred percent on that because I do not know the Scotch boilers as well as, as the Yarrow boilers. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and we were going to point out if anybody has like any questions, if, if want to correct me on anything that I've done uh, to leave the comments on the video, because I read the comments. Unfortunately, I can't read the, the chat window. <laughs> so if anybody's asking anything, yeah, it goes through, through Alex, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh you know after the video is over but yeah um uh, let's see i think oh i'll give you some 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 numbers here really quick um on the on the force draft air um she had 32 force draft fans and um uh, out of those 32 force draft fans she created 600 million cubic feet for every 24 hours 20,000 tons of air per hour or uh, uh, per 24 hours, uh, 25 million cubic feet per hour or 
416,000 cubic feet per minute. To, to give you an idea of how much air we're talking about, she would be able to fill the Hindenburg's gas bags in 17 minutes. She could fill three and a half Hindenburg's in 51 minutes. Wow. Um, okay, so to show you guys where the forced air came into the rooms, this I believe is boiler room two we're walking in. Um, let me see if one of these shots, I look up at the ceiling. So you, oh yeah, here we go. You can see one yeah. of the ducts here for the forced air system. This might even be actually the exhaust. It might be the exhaust actually. Yeah, that, I think that is exhaust. Because um, you can see it against the wall. And I do believe the Scotch boilers, their exhaust was like right up against the bulkhead. It's, it's kind of funny. The fan rooms, um, have been welded shut so you 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 after after the conversion they had sealed off the fan room so that you couldn't get access to them because what they had done was they had actually cut the deck plates that housed the the, the motor you know the fan motor and the and the um the uh the cage housing for the fans and cut the deck plate and load it down into the boiler room so they could they could take it out to, to get scrapped well, so they left a big giant hole in the deck, uh, in the fan rooms. Well, for some reason or another, during the course of you know being in Long Beach, somebody needed to get back into those fan rooms, and so you'll find a lot of times like a door that was welded has now had you know the welds cut, and and so then somebody put a padlock on it, but the padlock broke, and so some of the fan rooms you can actually get into. And it is a little scary because you know, you've got this pretty good sized room that you can walk around in. But if you're not looking where you're walking, you could suddenly come across a hole and fall, <laughs> fall, <laughs> fall, fall almost 50 feet down. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Same with same with like the the airlock uh, accesses to the upper deck catwalks to come into the boiler rooms. Um, you know, they lead out to a catwalk and, you know, of course that would you know lead to the, to the continuing maze of catwalks, you know, surrounding the boilers, but you know, all that's gone. So you can sometimes come to a hatch that, uh, like I said, you know, was welded at one time, but for some reason, somebody cut the welds and, and now in, in a lot of cases, those doors are open and you could walk through that hatch and have like a, a two foot section of catwalk that's there to stand out on. And I've done this. It's, <laughs> it's a little scary, but it's fun. Um, stand on a little two foot section of catwalk, you know, 50 feet up and look down. And then there's, I mean, there's nothing on either side of you. Oh, geez. Yeah. And I, I think here, I believe one of these here is for the forced air coming down from the top. Yeah. Of the ship because yeah, I, I believe you're right yeah because the funnel would have followed this curved um not curved a diagonal bulkhead here up to the hmm. center of the room and another hole that that you could also like fall through are the refuse hoist um access holes um there was a refuse hoist in the corners of each boiler room some some had it at the forward end some at the aft end and it's just, it's just like a round uh, oh, I'd say maybe two foot diameter hole. And uh, it was, you know, like a pulley set up, you know, where you could like, if you had trash or debris or something that was in the boiler room, you didn't have to like haul it up through the catwalks or anything. You could actually put it in the, in these, this hoist collect, uh, this refuse hoist and lower and raise it up to uh, D deck and then could be removed, you know, off the ship, you know, however they wanted to do it. But the hoists are gone, but the holes are there. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it's another hole that you could possibly fall through. Jeez. All right. So are we going to talk about the Yarrow boilers? Uh, you were going to say something about them after we talked about the Scotch boilers. I thought we had covered everything on the Yarrow boilers. Oh, I mean, okay. of course, no, 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 no. I shouldn't say that. We've We've covered what we... 
we should probably cover today because we could go into lots of other things about the the boilers, but we would be here for hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just looking to see if there was any any uh, other little fun facts. Um, let's see here. Oh, um, if anybody's ever looked at a photo, can you pull up a an in service picture of the middle funnel? The, uh, yeah, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> if this does it need to show uh, smoke? No. Okay, let me just find the. Oh, here's a close up. Okay, so. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so go ahead and yeah, zoom in. So you can see there on the forward port corner of the middle funnel is a big giant tube that's leading up from below up to the top. And on the other side of the funnel, on the aft starboard corner of the funnel, is another tube just like that going up and going coming from uh, below and, and heading up to the top. And those are the the waste steam exhaust pipes. And basically, if you are at, you know, the ship is traveling at, at 28, 29 knots, and uh, somebody falls overboard, the ship is now basically having to come to a, a dead stop or, or, or at least make a circle around and then come to a dead stop to, to launch a, uh, a, a rescue uh, party. Um, you are now having, you had a huge demand of steam and you suddenly have no demand for steam. Uh, you would have to bleed off the, the steam so that you didn't, you, you weren't running into overpressurization of the system. Mm -hmm. So anytime that was, they would ever need to bleed off steam from the, uh, the main steam line, it would come out through these pipes here. And a good example of that, folks, if you remember the movie Titanic, where they're starting to prepare the lifeboats, and then you get a close-up shot of Titanic's funnels, and all this steam is coming up through the a pipe along the side of the funnel. That's yes. the same thing here. It's that's for the releasing the excess steam pressure that is not needed. Exactly. <clears throat> well. I think, yeah, I think we've 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 covered what we needed to cover. Isn't it? Should we? I know we didn't show any photos of the uh, of uh, the 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 model. Do you? Oh, we, you want to show some? Yeah, I think that'd be fun. Uh, okay, let me give a little bit of a background of the. Uh... The uh, person I mentioned earlier, Robin Jacobs, uh, him and I have long been involved in a project that he had created back in, in 1996 called the Yarrow Project, which is a a uh, it was a proposal to Long Beach and the, and the operators of the Queen Mary to cosmetically uh, recreate uh, the boilers in Boiler Room 3 and Boiler Room 4. Um, and that's a whole that's a whole other story for another day. But uh, in the process of, of making these proposals for uh, you know, to be shown to the city and to, to the operators, uh, he created numerous models, um, one of which is seen here, which is a 148th scale model of a Yarrow water tube boiler. And uh, it's about maybe, oh, maybe about 18, 20 inches tall. And uh, you can see that there's smoke coming from the uh, from the exhaust at the top of the boiler. So let me tell you that he actually made this a functioning boiler. Uh, he had received a couple of gallons of Bunker C fuel oil that had been removed from the Queen Mary from somebody that was able to retrieve it during the conversion. He diluted it with, uh, I believe, with kerosene. And was able to make it, you know, thinned it out enough to where it was it was pumpable, 
and uh, this actually created, I think he about said about like 10 or 15 pounds of, of steam, but it was a fully functioning scale model water tube boiler. But in addition to this model, and, and oh, and this is the actual model. Um, it does not function today. It was dropped in a shipment uh, accident several years back, and so it no longer functions. But these are some photographs that uh, were taken recently of the model. And here you can see the uh, the uh, the furnace faces of the uh, of the boiler. You and can also kind of see some of the floor framework that was yes. Because the floor that the workers worked on was slightly above the tank tops in order to yeah. have easy access to these furnaces. So, right. He he put so much and to think like it, it was it was a big enough deal that it ran on actual bunker C oil and it actually pressurized. But then to have like a whole setup that makes it look, you know, miniature, you know, and and highly detailed. Oh, and and it lights up too. It's got working lights. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a picture of that. Well, actually, no, I don't have. Uh, I have a different model picture that. You have was, a different model. So, yeah. in addition to this model that was made, he also made a 148th scale um, model of the entire boiler room section of the Queen Mary, and with complete with uh, individual models of, of boilers. There we go. So, that's looking from the top down. The uh, the red areas on the left and the right, with the crisscross white, those are the tops of the fuel tanks. Um, what you are looking into, oh, you can actually see that there's the first class swimming pool tank. Oh, yeah, uh, in the, the distance, right. That's the pool tank itself. You're looking at uh, this would be boiler room three, looking forward, and that compartment that would be below the swimming pool would be the forward turbo generator room oh yeah right under here yeah you can see some of the uptakes for the yarrow boilers yep and they were all removable and you oh and you can see on there you can see c3 so we're looking at the starboard side of the of the uh, boilers there that, oh, so yeah. c3 and d3 were the starboard boilers of boiler room three and here's the pool tank again for first class first swimming pool tank pool. yeah mm-hmm And let's see. This is looking in between the boilers down at the service walkway. Yeah, actually, I think in this section here. Um, oh, oh, let's see. Yeah, so see. Yeah, so what you're actually seeing is the boiler rooms three and four, but the the bulkhead between three and four had been removed. It didn't get put into the model um, for access reasons. He had it. I mean, he could slide it into place, but those braces that you see at the top there, oh, these. Um, no, yeah, would be, they would actually be connected to the, to the, um, uh, to the bulkhead. But in this case, the bulkhead's been removed. Okay. Now, did the, do you, do you know if, where the bulkhead would end right here, was was it completely watertight up here, or was it open, kind of like Titanic's? Like, could, you know, supposedly, could water have spilled from one bulkhead up and over to the other? Well, that was always a possibility, because you had, you, you didn't have watertight doors leaning out of the boiler rooms up, you know, above, like, D-deck. You had watertight compartments um, in certain sections in the upper deck areas, but you could still spill over it. The bulkhead went to the top in those boiler rooms because you had to keep them pressurized. Yeah. Um, so you had the, you had the complete compartment compartmentalization for, for not only water, but for air. But, um, you know, once water reaches a certain point, um, it will find its way, you know, on those upper decks to spill over into another boiler room. I see. Okay. Wow. So their watertight their watertight integrity was literally just, you know, up to a certain height, but not not uh, not horizontally. We have here a view in between uh, two rows of boilers. 
Yeah, that's the, the firing platform. So that yeah, so that's boiler rooms three and four without boilers in them. Yep, which is pretty much and what that, you would see today. Right. And then here's the large set of boilers installed. Or no, this is the small set. There's a small set of boilers yeah, that's, installed. Yeah. That's boiler room three, and then boiler room four. You can see slightly larger boilers. Yeah. And then. Oh, that's a proprietary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here's a lighted version. So the, in the in the idea of the Yarrow project, just to kind of fill people in, the uh, uh, boiler room four was actually only going to have four of the boilers with the center boilers not installed. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to make the room available as a, 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 a multi-use venue uh you could you could have uh private functions you could have seminars you could have um uh, you could hold classrooms in there um and so yeah this is a, again boiler room four looking towards boiler room three and we had actually cut that bulkhead out um in the same basic way that the bulk the bulkhead is cut right now And we were looking at wanting to to keep that open um, to kind of give because that way you could see the face of that boiler as you walked in there. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm weird, but I always find it kind of funny that the, the Yarrow boilers, they almost have a kind of a Y shape to them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, some people will look at them and say it's a Y. Um, some will say it's a K. I, I can see, you know, either one is pretty accurate. That's true. I can kind of see a K. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we we have for to for to whoops for today. Um. Wow, I opened so many photos. <laughs> um, but yeah. So anyway, folks. Uh. We will be making more of these live streams where we kind of talk about the engineering of the ship. You know, uh, well, I think someone earlier was asking, like, if we would do one for, I don't know, the, I forget what what the person asked. But, yes, we will be talking about other uh, systems aboard the the ship and how it worked. So, oh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll be moving in. Um I know that I'm going to be leaving for Arizona in two weeks, but I'm hoping to, to get one out, you know, as soon as I get back. Yeah. And I'm just going through the comment section real quick to see if sure. anybody has asked a, a question that we could answer for them. Sure. Uh, okay. Well, nobody's really asked anything that I could answer. I've we've blown their minds. We have, I think. <laughs> uh, but um, you guys will learn more about the Yarrow project in the future because I am working with um, with Steve and with uh, Robin Jacobs, you know, uh, two of the the main people involved with the Yarrow project uh, to create presentations for you guys that you guys can see and. And you can learn more and more about it, and it it'll be really amazing uh, when it's done, and especially the the videos themselves narrated by Ernest Borg Nine and all that. There's a there's a, a trailer for it. If you guys want to see the trailer, it's on my channel. Um, it's literally the first video in my Queen Mary docu series playlist, and um, it's called uh, the Queen Mary Story, and it's just like a little like 50 second trailer. And so you guys can actually um, watch that trailer right now. And um, and yeah, so there will be, oh, I think, either two or maybe even three videos, all based on uh, the Yarrow Project, voiced by Ernest Borgnine. And it's coming to um, to the channel, yeah, in the future. It, it's, 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 it's a lot of work, so it is taking me time to do. But um, Anyway, folks, I want to thank you all for joining me and Steve. I know there was a lot of technical difficulties at the beginning of the live stream, and we were just, just struggling yeah. to just get this thing, you know, on the road. But I think ultimately we succeeded. <laughs> I think so. 
Well, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. All right, folks. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Gonna wait to...